All right, we going? Yes. All right. Good morning, everybody. I'm Blake Staub uh, from Texas Back Institute, one of the neurosurgeons down here. Uh, they let us kind of join along with the, this large orthopedic group and we're trying to make it better one day at a time. Um, <laughs> today, I figured we'd talk a little bit about uh, minimally invasive spinal deformity surgery. Uh, I think there's a lot to be said here. Um, you know, it, it's a way a lot of people are moving, but it's there, there's pros and cons that I figured we'd, we'd kind of touch base with. Um, so, uh, let's see if I can get my mouse working here. There we go. So, you know, when looking at health related quality of life, we know deformity surgery is helpful. Uh, when it's done well, when you don't have a complication, patients generally do well. Um, unfortunately, uh, it's deformity surgery. There are a lot of complications that come with big open deformity surgery. And thus, over the last 10 or so years, uh, people have been looking at using minimally invasive techniques to try to lessen, um, uh, those, those complications. So, so when talking about minimally invasive deformity surgery, uh, what we're really talking about is using these different strategies, uh, to try to lessen the overall morbidity of the surgery. So that's, you know, your X lifts, your NIST lifts and A lifts, uh, using perk screws and kind of, you know, a little newer stuff with anterior column reconstruction, um, and util utilizing these techniques to, to lessen, uh, the issues that, that we're having with open deformity surgery. Um, this study is from 2016, just looking at, um, the prevalence of these MIS techniques, um, with the SRS members, a big survey was done, um, and about 44% or so of, of people said they use these MIS techniques between one and 20% of the time, which is not very often. Um, and only 7% of people said they use these pretty much every time. Um, I bet these numbers would be shifted slightly, uh, now, you know, four or five years later. Um, but at the same time, you know, there's definitely, uh, you know, a group that still only uses a routine, you know, open deformity surgery. Um, you know, one of the big issues with MIS deformity surgery is who actually needs it, who does well. And if you look at a lot of the old papers, uh, we were under correcting a lot of people uh, with uh, spinal deformities. So these different algorithms were developed. Um, basically, the result is if you don't have that bad of a deformity, you're a pretty good candidate for minimally invasive deformity surgery. Um, but I think this kind of refined algorithm, the, the, the second version is actually pretty good and pretty helpful at, at determining who needs deformity surgery and kind of keeps you out of trouble and keeps you from undercorrecting somebody. Um, so just a quick case example, 53 year old lady um, who I saw with progressively worsening back pain, she failed all sorts of conservative treatment. Um, so here are her pictures. Um, relatively well sagittally aligned, uh, coronally just a 29 degree um, lumbar uh, degenerative curve, coronally overall well balanced. So if you look at your algorithm, uh, she, which hopefully will pop up here in a second, uh, she falls clearly into this class two, which is a multi-level MIS surgery with and without decompression. Um, I use this algorithm frequently and uh, also, here's a CT scan showing that she's rigid, and I think that's a huge point with MIS deformity surgery. Make sure the patients are, I'm sorry, not rigid. Uh, she has air in, in multiple levels here. Um, and so here's the uh, stage one, two-level lateral, two-level ALIF, um, and then able to put her back together pretty well with good both coronal and sagittal correction. She definitely has some degenerative changes at one, two, and you know we might have to address those in the future. But... I think this is kind of the ideal patient to address in a minimally invasive fashion with you know, X-lifts, A-lifts, and perk screws uh, to get her put back together. Uh, one other quick patient. Um, this is a lady who was fused in 1974 for uh, adolescent scoliosis. She now has an L5 radiculopathy and feels pitched forward. Her pelvic tilt's 39. She's got a 40 degree mismatch. This is a pretty big deformity, but as you see on the CT scan there on the right, she has air in the disc space. She's mobile at 5'1". Um, and so my thinking was with a minimally invasive TLIF, but then an open correction, because if we look at our algorithm, she falls into this class three category with circumferential M MIS um, or a hybrid technique. Um, so we did a 30 degree uh, minimally invasive ALIF, so an incision less than three inches. Um, and then we we're able to get 30 degrees of correction, got her pelvic tilt down to 21 and her mismatch down to 15 from 41. So she's, I saw her about two weeks ago. She's much improved and very happy. Um, so kind of summary for all this, I think MIS and hybrid deformity surgery have the roles, uh, flexibility. So getting that pre-op CT is paramount to figure out who actually is a good candidate for this. 
one thing we'll see in these papers is sometimes the best candidates for this are the ones that have the least deformity, which is interesting. And again, just because you can do MIS deformity surgery doesn't mean every patient is a candidate for that. Uh, so with that, let's move on to some papers and, and, and talk about this stuff in more detail. So let's get to our first paper. I think Dr. Stockton's gonna talk here. Yeah. You guys can hear me? Yep. Great. So Bobby Stockton, I'm one of the fellows at TBI this year. <clears throat> I'm just gonna discuss a paper. Um, hold on, I'm lagging. Okay. Um, published by the International Spine Study Group in 2016 titled a critical analysis of sagittal plane deformity correction with uh, minimally invasive adult spinal deformity surgery. And it's a two year follow up study. Um, can you go to the next slide? It's not working for me. Try just the arrow on your keyboard, Bobby. There it goes. My computer's just a, a dinosaur. Um, <clears throat> so this is, uh, as we kind of went over, uh, minimally invasive spine surgery is gaining popularity over the past decade or so. Um, MIS surgery has been proven to minimize blood loss, decrease morbidity <clears throat> um, in cases expedite recovery, and in some instances even reduce cost. <clears throat> um, so for these reasons, MIS seems attractive for treating adult spinal deformity, especially given the fact um, of the high complication rates that are associated with traditional open techniques. Um, however, <clears throat> the ability for MIS surgery to achieve alignment goals is less clear and needs to be looked at further. Um, and since we don't know the ability of the MIS surgery to achieve alignment goals, um, and we do know that restoration of sagittal balance is critical for clinical success in these patients. That's what they're looking to kind of discover from this study here. So this is a retrospective multi-center review of 63 um, ASD patients underwent MIS surgery in 2009, 2012, um, which is pretty early on in the MIS deformity world. Um, the inclusion criteria, age greater than 18, uh, cob, major cob angle over 20 degrees, sagittal vertical axis over five centimeters, pelvic tilt over 25 degrees, and a thoracic kyphosis greater than 60 degrees. The study didn't include any patients with neuromuscular conditions, tumors, or infections. And the patients were stratified into groups based off of the, uh, the Schwab Global Alignment Modifier, um, zero plus and two plus based off of their sagittal vertical axis. And um, the health related quality of life outcome <clears throat> measures that were included were ODI, NRS back and leg at baseline and two years post-operatively. And fusion was evaluated using the bridwell lanky grading system. So here's the baseline data from the study for each individual group, zero plus, two plus. Um, 63 patients, like I said, met all the inclusion criteria. Uh, mean follow-up was 35 months. Mean age was 60 years old. 74% of these patients were female. Um, all groups were similar with respect to their um, health rated quality of life outcome measures and um, as well as their coronal imbalance. Uh, and um, to no surprise groups, uh, plus a two plus had lower mean lumbar lordosis and greater mismatch when compared to group zero. Another thing to note from this slide is that um, there is an age difference when you compare group zero to group two plus, which could be problematic just evaluating data. Here's the treatment data <clears throat> from the study. Uh, table includes EBL and total operation time, which I don't really know how useful that would be in a multi-center multi retrospective review, but they include it anyway. And it kind of gives just some generalized information which could be useful. Um, 
uh, kind of breaks down sort of the inner bodies that were used, uh, techniques. Um, but I think, interestingly, the mean length of stay was the same between all groups. Um, and the patients in the zero and plus group are more likely to have instrumentation terminate distally at L5 or above when compared to the patients with the more severe sagittal imbalance, which is what we would expect. And 38.1% uh, of patients had their spines fused to pelvis with significantly greater proportion of those patients um, in group two plus, which is what we would also sort of anticipate. Um, this is two-year clinical radiographic outcome data. So the overall fusion rate in the study was 84% and was not different between groups. Um, the Cobb angle improved in all three groups significantly, um, but the correction was less than 50% of the Cobb angle, which is pretty consistent with other MIS studies. Um, group zero and plus improved in all um, health related quality of life outcome measures. Um, and conversely, those with the severe sagittal imbalance did not improve clinically as well as the less severe patients did. This is a figure that kind of tells a story for the whole study. Um, and it's just a post-operative change in global alignment for each respective group. So in group zero, about 80% of the patients stayed a zero with their SVA less than four and a half centimeters, which is what we want. 20% of people progressed in the plus group, 60% of people stayed a plus, which is uh, not what you'd necessarily want to see. You'd want to see more patients kind of go to that um, less severe zero uh, alignment modifier group, which only 20% of those patients did. And it's kind of the same story for the most severe group. 63% of those people did not improve with respect to their sagittal imbalance. So the majority of patients with preoperative sagittal imbalance did not improve after their surgery. So interestingly, the primary benefit of MIS surgery may also be its primary obstacle. Um, these patients that have adult spinal deformity often have pretty rigidly deformed spines. And from what I have seen require pretty significant tissue release and um, in, in order to adequately release those tissues, we have to sometimes open the spine for the realignment purposes. Um, so this is obviously difficult to achieve with the MIS exposures and with the more traditional open approaches, um, you can use those more powerful corrective maneuvers while minimizing your stress on your fixation. So the results of the study suggest that severe sagittal imbalance is inadequately treated with MIS surgery. And the patients with more severe sagittal plane deformities are probably better served with hybrid surgeries or traditional open surgical techniques um, to kind of restore the sagittal imbalance, which is what Dr. Staub was talking about before. Limitations of the study. Of course, there's uh, limitations to just retrospective multicenter studies in general, um, but in this study, there's no standardization with respect to the MIS techniques that were utilized. Um, they included both circumferential and posterior only surgeries, and they didn't really indicate kind of the breakdown too well, which I thought was interesting. Um, the patients in the two plus group were significantly older than the patients in the less, the least severe sagittal imbalance group, which implies, which could imply that these groups represent different populations. And uh, it would have been interesting to see an equivalent study evaluating the change of alignment using standard open techniques um, for comparison purposes. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Bobby. That, that was good. Um, you know, I, I think the one thing we definitely have to mention with, with this paper in particular is the data was 2009 to 2012, right? So you know, that people weren't really doing intracolumn reconstruction then. Um, that is a new technique, or it's not really new anymore, but another technique to get um, a lot more lordosis from a lateral position. That being said, it usually requires kind of an open uh, posterior column osteotomy to really compress down in the back. So is it really minimally invasive? 
Um, I think Dr. German would have a lot to say about whether the, these surgeries are really minimally invasive. Just because you use an X-lift, I'm not sure that makes it a minimally invasive procedure. Um, the other thing I would say, which is really important, again, uh, is you really need a CT scan for these cases. Um, I've been burned a couple times where I, I look at an MRI or an X-ray and think a level's mobile, and you get in there to do your lateral where you're planning on getting all your correction, and all of a sudden the, the facets are fused and you can't move that level. Um, so, so I really think we need to pay attention to getting CT scans before, and I think that's something we've learned. And again, that this data might be different if you take out those few patients with auto-fused levels uh, that maybe we didn't know about uh, prior to going in for surgery. I totally agree with you, Blake. You know, as many of you know, I'm kind of an MIS aficionado, but I'm not dogmatic about it. And so I think really the key to being successful with minimally invasive is, is knowing who is an appropriate candidate for doing it. And, and, you know, that perfect slide with the hammer and the nail, it doesn't mean that everybody is going to benefit from a minimally invasive surgery. And so a lot of these patients with more severe deformities, as you said, rigid deformities, you know, it, it, you're not doing them any favors by doing this muscle sparing surgery that doesn't actually address their underlying problem. And, and so that's where I employ you to, to help me on these kind of bigger cases where I don't think they can benefit from MIS or perhaps a hybrid where you'll do, right. you know, MIS stuff with an open posterior release, because a lot of the times those posterior elements can block you from, from getting the deformity correction that you really want. And that's where I was surprised in this paper. They had a very small number of ALIFs. It was like almost zero. And, you know, TBI, we use those a lot. I know a lot of people do, but like that's the best way at four, five or five, one really to build that lordosis back in. And as the case I presented, you put a 30 degree cage in and just a, you do a posterior column osteotomy with minimal blood loss and you save yourself a PSO through a giant fusion mass. Um, so that, that's where I think, you know, again, some of this data would change if you threw a couple of ALIFs in there, kind of newer ways of doing this as, as opposed to uh, just relying on laterals to try to get your correction. In particular, yeah. the hyperlordotic ALIFs that we're using down at 4.5 and 5.1, you know, even, sure. even if people were using ALIFs then, very rarely, I think, were they using 30 degree cages like we are. Um, but that does come back to the fact that if you're using a 30 degree cage, many times you have to do a real, you know, Smith Pete type osteotomy in the back in order to get it closed down. Yeah, I think it would be interesting to repeat this study with, uh, as you said, Blake, uh, you know, some of the techniques that we're doing in 2021 um, and see if it actually does make a difference for the people with larger sagittal imbalance, um, you know, perhaps, uh, you know, and I think the other nuance is identifying, you know, even people in the uh, lower sagittally imbalanced group who may not benefit, you know, it's not certainly a cure-all. So I think, you know, things like AI and different out, you know, further refining algorithms to look for, um, you know, the patients that may not necessarily benefit um, from MIS techniques. For sure. All right. Any other comments before we move on? All right. Why don't we go to the next paper here? All right. Can you hear me now? All right, I'm Dave Barnes, one of the other uh, spine fellows here at TBI. Uh, I'm presenting the article on treatment of the fractional curve of adult scoliosis with circumferential minimally invasive surgery versus traditional open surgery. This came from the Global Spine Journal from 2018. So a little background, you know, the fractional curve is the curve below the major curve from L4 to S1, usually sometimes L5 to S1. And it's often the most symptomatic aspect of a patient's disease pathology in regards to adult uh, scoliosis. And it's frequently the principal reason a patient may choose to undergo surgery. Uh, so etiology of symptoms comes from uh, compression usually of the dorsal uh, root ganglion, which is caused from uh, up-down stenosis and the uh, concavity of the fractional curve. And um, it's... Uh, further progressed by degeneration of the lower lumbar spine with decreased uh, uh, disc height. Uh, treatment is often, uh, well, the symptoms are often refractory to conservative treatment, and uh, it's critical to address the, the up-down stenosis of the uh, fractional curve to fully alleviate the, the patient's symptoms. So as we've talked uh, prior, there are multiple uh, techniques to go about treating the fractional curve or the fractional curve and the major curve including open posterior surgery with direct D 
decompression or minimally invasive techniques, uh, utilizing many different techniques to get indirect decompression. Uh, this article focuses mainly on circumferential MIS techniques. So the, the objective of this article was to evaluate the outcomes of treatment of the fractional curve in adult scoliosis via circumferential uh, minimally invasive surgery techniques with inner body distraction versus traditional open posterior surgical treatment. So they looked at two, uh, there's a retrospective review, they looked at two multi-center adult spinal deformity databases. Uh, the open database came from 11 institutions. It was prospectively collected and retrospectively reviewed. The MIS database came from 10 institutions. Uh, only included in the study were patients that underwent circumferential MIS techniques, and it was a retrospective uh, registry. They included patients over the age of 18, minimum three levels of fusion, two years of follow-up, uh, SVA over five centimeters, pelvic tilt over 20 degrees, uh, lumbar scoliosis, uh, Cobb angle of 20 degrees, PIL level mismatch of over 10 degrees, and the fractional curve had to be over 10 degrees to be included. They uh, excluded any contracts that stopped at L5, and then any hybrid techniques were excluded as well. And then uh, these, uh, the open and MIS groups were then uh, matched by levels fused to create a, a uh, matched cohort. So there's 165 patients with complete two-year data. 118 had uh, fractional curves treated. And then when they were matched by levels fused, they came up with a, uh, a matched cohort of, of 40 patients, 20 in each uh, group. So looking at the results, uh, mainly of the matched cohort the levels treated in the match cohort were not significantly different. Uh, many more patients in the MIS group had stage procedures. There was much more pelvic fixation in the open group. Um, operative time, not surprising, was increased in the MIS group over about an hour. But the open group did have, um, oh, there it goes, did have increased uh, blood loss of 2,300 cc's versus 800 cc's. Um, the open group underwent open decompression uh, and direct decompression about 80% of the time where the MIS group only had uh, open decompression about 22% of the time. And of course, the MIS technique uh, had 100% inner bodies versus 35% in the open group. Looking at uh, the correction that they obtained in the matched cohort, there is no significant difference in pre and post operative change in coronal Cobb level in the major curve, PIL mismatch, or lumbar lordosis. Uh, looking at the fractional curve itself, preoperatively, there was no difference in the matched cohort of the fractional curve uh, magnitude. Uh, there was no significant difference in the uh, post operative curve either, and so no difference in the, the improvement obtained. Of note, the uh, open group did have a much greater correction in SVA versus the MIS group. Looking at uh, patient reported outcomes, no difference in ODI and VAS uh, 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 back uh, scores between pre and post operatively in the patients. Uh, looking at VAS uh, leg uh, pain scores preoperatively, there was no significant difference in the match cohort, um, no difference uh, post operatively. Uh, in, in their improvement that they obtained. However, the MIS group in the matched cohort did trend a little better. And if you look at the unmatched cohort, uh, they did have a significantly, uh, statistically significant improvement in the uh, vast uh, leg pain scores. So I, I think this uh, article brings up a lot of good questions that are not completely answered with this article, but um, you know, is, uh, direct decompression necessary if the uh, updone or cephalocaudal um, framosnosis is addressed by correction of the deformity and restoration of disc height? Is an inner body necessary when utilizing open techniques and using uh, wide decompression, stabilization, and correction of the deformity? Only about one third of the patients in the, the matched uh, cohort that underwent open techniques had a, an inner body placed. And then uh, What's the role of treatment of the of only the fractional curve and addressing just the symptomatic levels? If you look at the unmatched cohort who uh, then went uh, significantly fewer levels fused, but had a much greater improvement in vast lake pain scores overall. So there, there's definitely some limitations to the study. It's a you know retrospective study in nature. It was underpowered to detect significant differences between the two groups. There's only 40 patients, 20 patients in each group. 
there is some selection bias with uh, patients with a higher uh, Bass Lake scores were more frequently treated with uh, MIS techniques. And also MIS surgeons did not enroll their uh, deforming patients that were treated with open techniques. Uh, also the cohorts are, are not pure, should say not pure, um, not purely decompression without inner body versus inner body uh, without decompression. So that would have been nice to see. Uh, and then many more MIS uh, patients under one stage procedures, which it's unclear if staging of the surgeries could have improved their pain perception in, in these patients. So, it, you know, overall inclusion, you know, to answer the question, can circumferential MIS techniques be used to effectively treat the fractional curve versus open techniques? You know, in this study, they used curve magnitude of greater than 10 degrees as a proxy for up-down foraminal stenosis on the concavity of the fractional curve, causing leg pain. Vast leg pain scores were used as a reflection of the treatment efficacy of the fractional curve. And then overall, there's no significant difference in vast leg pain scores with fewer open decompressions in the MIS group. So overall, I think it supports the validity of indirect decompression um, but, uh, using MIS techniques for correction of deformity. And treatment of the fractional curve, it, it's definitely a you know, proof of concept that circumferential MIS techniques may be a viable option in the treatment of the fractional curve, but larger direct uh, comparison studies need to, be, uh, need to be done to further evaluate this. All right, thanks, Dave. Uh, you know, I, I think one of the big takeaways from this paper and from some of the other ones we're gonna talk about today uh, is really how important, at least I think, inner bodies are, um, especially at the fractional curve. I mean, what, we're, what are we really treating these patients for, right? They come and complain of back pain, sure, but really it's the leg pain that drives them oftentimes into our office. Um, and if you're doing an open decompression, you're taking out the whole facet to really open up a foramen, now you have to worry about fusion because you've lessened the potential fusion surfaces. So I, I really think an inner body, whether you're doing this open or minimally, truly minimally invasively, I think is really important. And Dr. Lieberman, you want to touch on that at all? I know you use a lifts at the bottom of all of your contracts. I really think for one, for this reason alone, to kind of open up the frame and also generate a fusion. Yeah, we've we've uh, learned a lot about treating that fractional curve over the years. You alluded to the ability to restore lordosis at the lumbosacral junction, which is critical. You also alluded to the fusion rates, which are much better when we've got the inner bodies, particularly at that bottom level. Uh, the neurological issue, and this is something that we still have to study, and we definitely need better prospective studies because all of our decisions now are being made on retrospective studies. But I just want to bring up this one entity that's kind of the, the forgotten stepchild of these fractional curves. Everyone's concentrating on the radiculopathy due to the concave compression. But remember, they also present of radiculopathy on the convex side at the junctional level between the main curve and the fractional curve, where you get some listhesis towards the concavity and the nerve root going off to the opposite side is being kinked by the pedicle. And this is where I think the interbodies really help because it gets you that derotation. So the convex side nerves also get decompressed. They're not stretched as much as they're coming around the corner. So remember that when you're evaluating these patients with fractional curves and, you know, ask them about their opposite side leg. If, if they've got the fractional curve affecting L5 on the right, I wouldn't be surprised that they're complaining of some proximal thigh pain and may have some quads weakness because of L3 or L4 radicular symptoms due to the particular kinking on the convexity. Great, thank you. Hey, I, I see we have Dr. Anand on board as a panelist now. I don't know if he's available to chat. I, I would love for him to chime in given that he's kind of, his name's on most of these papers. All right, thanks guys. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Yes. Um, fantastic, fantastic discussion. Uh, honestly, I think you guys are discussing it really well. My only comment would be that, and you alluded to, these are really very early on retrospective papers from what we were doing. Honestly, it was the first stab at doing a multi-center study, where otherwise it was just sort of one or two centers. So it really was the first stab. A lot to get from it. We learned a lot from it. Obviously, I think we've come a long way, but I, I think you guys are discussing it really well. And I completely agree with Izzy. The convex side is as important as the concave. We always forget the convex side, and that hurts. And he's right, the antibodies what does it. 
Five one is an alif, alif, and alif. We did axilif. That paper has axilif. Please don't do it. It is a disaster, <laughs> and I will openly say it. Thanks. Sage man. advice. Thanks so much. All right, let's get on to the next paper and. Real quick, sorry to sorry to interrupt. Um, to to Barnes's point about whether or not you, if you don't do a direct decompression, if you will potentially need one in the future, um, I actually wrote up our TBI experience of people that just got either a standalone ALIF or a, a 360 without a decompression, just indirect decompression, um, but, um, mostly for radicular type symptoms. And what we found was there was only about a four percent return to the operating room rate. Um, for, a, for a direct decompression if what you're using is an A-lift. So it's pretty good at reestablishing that foraminal height and, and alleviating um, any radiculopathy associated with it. How did those 4% fare, Peter? Did it resolve their symptoms? Uh, they did. So they yeah. ended up the same as the patients who had a decompression initially. Interesting. <clears throat> Well, I'll continue this discussion. My name is Jacob Scrum, I'm one of the Texas VAC fellows. Uh, I'm here to discuss the impact of increasing inner body fusion levels at the fractional curve on lordosis, curve correction, and complications in adults with scoliosis. This was published in 2020 in the Journal of Neurosurgery of Spine, and I do think it's a very fair title to the paper. Uh, the arrow... My apologies. So the purpose of this paper was to analyze the efficacy and morbidity of using one versus two and three inner bodies to treat the fractional curve of scoliosis with concordant ipsilateral radiculopathy. And we've talked about what that definition of fractional curve, but it's basically the smaller curve above the uh, or below the major curve. The criteria that the, that the group used in this study included patients that had fractional curves from L3 to S1, um, greater than 10 degrees ipsilateral radiculopathy, one uh, plus inner body fusions with at least one year follow-up. The exclusion was uh, less than 10 degree fractional curve, less than or poor follow-up and exclusive sagittal plane deformity. Um, they took all this data, the objective data they could find and kind of uh, analyzed it. And there was quite a bit of data. So I think uh, the most important thing is reading the charts before you read the words in this paper. But here table one, they're ultimately presenting that really between these patients, between one, two and three inner bodies, there's no difference in terms of the patient demographics, ASA, and uh, parameters radiographic. This table, uh, number two, what they wanted to say is we took these similar patients and we treated them differently. So uh, they talk about uh, in, in these patients that were treated differently, that uh, surprisingly, that they found that there was no difference in the procedure duration between one, two, and three inner bodies. Their length of stay was the same. EBL was similar. Uh, they did find a difference in terms of pelvic fixation as, and, and it trended towards the more uh, inner bodies you use, the more they had pelvic fixation, which I think kind of uh, goes to the paper talking about maybe the idea is you're building a stronger foundation as you're adding more inter bodies because then you're also adding more pelvic fixation. So that's something to keep in mind. They talk about how uh, the, uh, the open surgery, I mean, between 94 and 100%, the BMP use is the same. And they talk about how uh, there were uh, more titanium cages used in the one to two uh, levels, as well as more average lordosis was provided by the cages as you use more inner bodies. Table three talks about how the complications in, in, within these patients were pretty similar. Um, there is a question in their 30 day readmission, which I think is just an error. They talk about how 76% of patients return to uh, the hospital within 30 days, but I think they just uh, miscalculated by an order of magnitude. They talk about how there is a difference in terms of when you have three inner body uh, that you had extension surgery due to PJK, but otherwise extension surgery due to any other cause was not significantly different. And ultimately that those that had more inner bodies had a larger lumbar lordosis increase and a better um, resolution of the PI lumbar lordosis mismatch. And then they took a uh, table four and they say, wait, hold up. Um, actually our initial patients that we said that were all equal, this is secondary analysis, were actually a little different. Um, if you break them down by ALIFs, those with ALIFs had uh, a greater uh, PI lumbar lordosis mismatch than the patients that we chose to use T lifts on, um, as well as the uh, number of um, 
titanium cages that were used um, as you got to the Mortilla realm. Those were more titanium cages than peak. And then the Lordosis provided, uh, there was a, a greater number from the Aleph group. And then our last table talks about how the complications and um, outcomes in the patients that those received a TLIF and those re uh, that received an ALIF. And um, they looked at revision surgery due to non-extension purposes was higher in the ALIF group, as well as the lumbar lordosis increase um, was much greater in those that received an ALIF. Here you have a 9.1 degrees as well as negative 0.87 and they talk about coronal balance as well. So I think this paper um, highlights multiple things. It, it talks about how additional levels of inner body fusions to three levels didn't increase complication rates. I think that's an important point. Um, goes to the idea of building a stronger foundation, adding more inner body fusions at the bottom. And don't forget, these are the same patients that also receive more likely uh, pelvic fixation. Um, given that the patients that received an ALIF uh, had a much greater lumbar lordosis PI mismatch. Uh, maybe it's kind of more referencing to also that when you need a larger lumbar lordosis uh, correction, uh, you can do an ALIF, but also TLIF is okay for those who don't. Maybe that's a possible conclusion from this paper as well. One thing that this patient paper lacked was patient reported outcomes. It doesn't talk about ultimately how these patients did, those that received less inner bodies or more, as well as uh, how they felt after surgery. These were just pretty much objective radiographic uh, parameters and some statistics from the intra-op. Um, another uh, statement that stood out from this paper talks about how radiculopathy from the fractional curve below the major scoliotic curve can be the impetus for choosing surgery. So that brings up the question, um, how much should we be doing uh, above this fractional curve? Should we, what can we do locally at this fractional segment? And then how far can we uh, do above? And I think that's when the discussion talks about, or this, the paper didn't mention it, but is there a role for stage surgery? Do you maybe treat the fractional curve, um, stage it, kind of decide what you're gonna do posteriorly after patients have a couple of days to walk around and kind of see how they do with their symptoms. And again, um, I bring up how much should be done above the fractional curve. Great, thanks, Jacob. I think your last point was really good. Um, I, I think there's definitely a role for simply treating the fractional curve alone um, and kind of seeing how patients do. Um, I think the other really important or, or great part about an inner body is you can do an inner body, stage it, and to your point, patients' leg pain and back pain get better if you do a two or a three level inner body, and you might be able to avoid that T10 uh, to pelvis operation. Um, I think the other big takeaway from that paper is that if you want to do a T lift, if you can't do an A lift or a lateral, you better work really, really hard to, to build in some lordosis. Because if you're doing a T lift at L5S1 and getting negative 0.87 degrees of lordosis, you're not doing anybody any favors. Um, so I'm with Dr. Nan in saying that L5S1 is an A lift, A lift, A lift, if at all possible. Um, any other comments from, from the peanut gallery here? Yeah, the, here's a peanut gallery from Seattle. Uh, the yeah. head peanut. Uh, <laughs> I just want to point out that we have uh, greatness with us. Dr. Jean Dubussy is joining us from Paris Live. So uh, I think a public acknowledgement of that we're uh, really all benefiting from the shoulders of this giant uh, who has basically brought us forward so much. Thank you for joining us, Jean. And we'll try to bring you over into the, uh, the uh, main peanut gallery of the panelists. Uh, thank you, Blake, for that acknowledgement. Um, so the, the key point that I want to make is when we have inner body fusions, so much depends upon the technique. And we're looking at an endpoint that is the description of the procedure when in fact what matters is the surgical technique. Uh, my practice consists of a lot of revision surgeries and again, both MIS and open. And uh, most of the problems I see is just poor craftsmanship. So uh, uh, when I see teep lift, it's not a teep lift if you just throw in a piece of metal in about five minutes. If you prepare the end plates properly to a proper release, it works just fine. Same goes for an A lift where you stuff in some plastic material uh, with some alleged cell-based uh, cell bone graft uh, substitute that uh, basically just sits in there and floats. So craftsmanship and attention to detail matters a lot. For me, if I were to look critically at the methodology differences of the techniques, I would look at subsidence and I would look at uh, the delta of the initial restoration towards the final restoration. And that's something that really takes a minimum of two years follow-up. So thanks for letting me pipe in from Seattle there, Blake. Great session, by the way. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. I appreciate it. 
All right. I guess we can move on to the last paper. So this, this last paper, a um, little bit different take on things, but I, I think, you know, when we're talking about minimally invasive surgery, we're not necessarily talking about three and four rod constructs. So I thought this was kind of really important to, to throw in here and kind of validate maybe some of the ways we're doing minimally invasive surgery. So uh, go ahead, Dan. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Dan Caridley. I'm one of the spine fellows at TBI. And I'll be presenting this study by Godzik and others out of the Barrow Neurological Institute uh, entitled Supplemental Rods Are Needed to Maximally Reduce Rod Strain Across the Lumbosacral Junction with T-Lift, but not A-Lift in Long Constructs. Uh, so as we all know, adult spinal deformity surgery tends to involve longer constructs with longer lever arms that can put concentrated stress at weak points of the construct, such as at the sites of three column osteotomy or at the lumbosacral junction. Because of these biomechanical forces, rod failure is unfortunately a common complication of deformity surgery with reported rates in the literature as high as 18 and percent. Not surprisingly, rod failure has been shown to correlate significantly with lower patient reported outcome scores. Instrumenting to the ilium is a commonly utilized strategy in adult uh, spinal deformity surgery to strengthen fixation at the caudal end of the construct. Uh, and while, but while biomechanical studies have shown this to be protective of the S1 screws, uh, it also increases rod strain across the lumbosacral junction. Um, one possibility to address this issue is the use of multi-rod constructs. Studies have shown that they reduce rates of rod failure and pseudarthrosis at three column osteotomy sites and at the lumbosacral junction. Another strategy to significantly strengthen a construct is through anterior column support. And the literature has shown this increases construct stiffness and reduces the incidence of posterior instrumentation failure. However, there have not been any studies looking at the interplay between anterior column support and multi-rod constructs. Uh, and that's what this study sought to address. In particular, this study looked at how those two factors, both separately and when combined, influence the mechanical aspects of a long construct at the lumbosacral junction. So in this biomechanical study, they used 14 L1 to pelvis cadaver specimens that were divided into two groups, a T-lift group and an A-lift group. Specimens were matched for age, gender, and bone density. The specimens were anchored to a testing device, cephalata L1 and caudally at the distal ilium. They were instrumented from L2 to the pelvis using 6-5 screws from L2 to L5, 7-5 screws at S1, and 9-5 by 80 millimeter screws in the ilium. Uh, the constructs were con connected using two 5.5 millimeter cobalt chrome rods. For their multi-rod constructs, they used four rods in total, adding two additional rods to the same of the same size medially with two side connectors. In the group one, the, uh, they used A-lift cages uh, at L5S1, uh, which were anchored with three 5.0 by 25 millimeter screws through the cage, one into L5 and two into S1. The cages were all 28 millimeters in width, but varied in lordosis from 15 to 20 degrees. In the second group, they placed uh, left-sided T-lift cages at L5S1 using the standard T-lift technique involving a left-sided facetectomy. The T-lift cages had a standard length of 30 millimeters, uh, but varied in height from 10 to 12 millimeters, depending on the specimen. Here are some images of the constructs that they tested. So the specimen on the top left is a two rod construct, whereas a four rod construct is seen on the top right. On the bottom left are AP and lateral images of the A-lift plus four rod construct. And on the bottom right are AP and lateral images of the T-lift plus four rod construct. So they tested these specimens by loading them in flexion, extension, lateral bending, and axial rotation. Following those bending tests, uh, a pure compression load was applied uh, with a force of up to 400 Newtons. Uh, to assess the bending moment on the S1 screws, they took measurements from four strain gauges placed circumferentially in opposing pairs. They also assessed rod strain at the lumbosacral junction with gain strain gauges placed dorsally and ventrally on both rods at the L5-S1 junction. Range of motion was measured using infrared emitting markers on different vertebrae. 
For statistics, they compared baseline specimen characteristics using t-tests and compared peak strain, range of motion, and bending moments using an analysis of variance with paired home SIDAC tests. Comparing the two, the two different groups of specimens that they used for the T-LIF and A-LIF constructs, we can see that there was no difference between the groups in terms of age, DEXA scores, gender, or baseline range of motion. Looking at their results in terms of range of motion at L5S1, they found all of the interbody plus two rod constructs had significantly less range of motion in flexion, extension, and com compression compared to no interbody. Uh, however, they found that the T-lift plus two rod construct in extension did not have decreased range of motion, likely owing to the facetectomy. Additionally, the T-lift plus two rod construct had an increased range of motion in left lateral bending compared to no interbody, again, likely owing to the facetectomy. They found no significant difference in range of motion in any of the groups with axial rotation. Looking now at rod strain, they found that in flexion, extension, and compression, all of the A-lift constructs, both two rods and four rods, reduced strain compared to no interbody. However, only the four rod T-lift constructs reduced strain significantly. With lateral bending, the A-lift plus two rod construct reduced strain compared to no interbody, whereas the T-lift plus two rod and T-lift plus four rod constructs had no significant effect on lateral bending. And interestingly, with axial rotation, there was actually increased rod strain with the A-lift plus two rod construct, but no significant difference in any of the T-lift constructs. Looking at the bending moments in the sacral screws, with flexion, extension, and compression, they found a significant decrease in all A-lift groups compared to no interbody, whereas there was no significant difference in either the two rod or four rod T-lift constructs. There was no significant difference in any of the constructs in terms of sacral screw bending moment with lateral bending. However, with axial rotation, there is decreased bending moment with either interbody plus two rods on the contralateral side. Uh, and in addition, the A-lift with two rods construct had a significantly lower bending moment compared to T-lift with two rods. So to summarize their findings, they found that both T-lift and A-lift decreased range of motion at L5-S1. However, the T-lift with two rods construct did not, crease, did not decrease extension and left-sided bending range of motion, which is probably due to the left-sided facetectomy. They also found that the A-lift with two rods and T-lift with four rods reduced uh, strain in flexion and extension, but T-lift with two rods did not. They found that the A-lift decreased sacral screw bending moments with flexion and extension, whereas the T-lift constructs did not. Taking all of these results together, they show that the addition of anterior column support significantly improves the construct mechanics, with A-lift seeming to have superior mechanical properties to T-lift, unless additional rods are added to the T-lift construct. These findings corroborate prior studies showing that multi-rod constructs are better when, anterior when the anterior column is destabilized with a three-column osteotomy. Here we see that a smaller footprint anterior, anterior column support in the form of a T-lift has improved mechanical properties with the addition of posterior rods. The limitations of this study include that it's an in vitro study that gives us a snapshot of the biomechanics of different constructs right after surgery, but it doesn't shed light at all on fusion rates, rod failure rates, or clinical outcomes. And therefore, further study is needed to determine the optimal L5-S1 construct in clinical practice. All right. Thanks, Dan. Um, you know, I think we have uh, Dr. Dubasay on here, so we'd be remiss to not ask him a question. Um, so, so Dr. Dubase, I, I, in, you know, in the United States, at least a lot of people are using three, four, five rods, even, uh, with deformity surgeries. Um, so I'm just curious kind of how, what your inner body technique is at L5 S1, and then how many rods are you using to cross the, the lumbosacral junction? Jean, do you hear us? Can you turn your microphone on? may not work right now. We've okay, moved. okay. You, oh, there you are. Fantastic. Okay. We can see you, your you know, Move you the camera know. down. Yes, and everybody, uh, I'm very happy to, to be with you because I am here to learn, no, 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 not to say something. Uh, 
the only thing about the, the, the pelvic fixation, it's uh, why I, I have said this many times when I was at the, at the Seattle, in Seattle, where, why you never use uh, uh, the iliosacral screw. You use the, the fixation on the pelvis uh, uh, too much laterally and not on, on the sacrum because the iliosacral screw has a direction completely opposite that the one that you, you use it. And it allows some motion uh, uh, inside the SI joint. And this is good for alignment and, and, and less, less uh, stresses on the, on, the, on, the, on the posterior rods. So this is a, a question, but I am here mainly to learn, not to teach. Thank you so much for everything you, you, you did. Jean, we want to see your face. Move the camera down. What? Jack, move the camera down. We just see your hair. Ah. Or stand up. Move ah, the camera ah, down. Ah. We want to see your face. Your eyes. It's ah. better. Très bien. <laughs> Bonjour, Much better. Professor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, all, all of you. Thank you, all of you. So, so can I ask a question, Professor Dubisset? Should yeah. we not fuse the SI joint? Are you saying we should leave the SI joint unfused after we do a long construct? Yes, I am. I am still thinking that the SI joints is necessary a little bit to adapt, to adapt uh, uh, not only on the AP, but uh, not only on the sagittal, but it's necessary to have some motion, a little bit of motion in the SI joint. Uh, for me, this is. Uh, I think that it is important. Hey, I want to point out a little vignette that uh, our Dallas colleagues may not know. Professor Dubisset um, was a, a practicing visiting professor at the Texas Scottish Rite Hospital in Dallas, Texas, in I believe 1987. And so he's actually an honorary Texan. So it's particularly meaningful that in today's journal club, uh, where we have uh, TBI host this amazing conference, we have Dr. Dubisset return to his Texas roots, where he influenced a whole large generation of uh, future surgeons and helped so many kids was amazing knowledge, which by the way, goes way beyond scoliosis into all aspects of pediatric orthopedics, such as oncology. And uh, I don't even wanna go into all the genetic syndromes that he knows. So he's an encyclopedic knowledge uh, for him. Uh, so he is an honorary Texan. So uh, thank you for joining us, Jean. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you, Jens. For, yeah, for, for, I just want to recognize Dr. Dubisset. It's so cool that you're joining us here. Jens. Yeah, in addition to being an honorary Texan, he really is an icon in the world of spine. I mean, everybody knows him. And you made such advancements to what we do today that uh, for our fellows here, I hope you appreciate that normally you wouldn't get to meet someone uh, like Dr. Dubasset. So, uh, John, thank you for being on. It's really a, an honor for all of us. I mean, everybody. Thank you. Thank you John, it is, uh, it is a privilege to see you again, my friend. It's been, uh, been quite some time, and I'm glad to see that you're looking healthy and happy. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to highlight with the papers, and Jens alluded to this, and Dan brings it out in that biomechanical study, and I know John talked about this years ago. It's not the hardware. It's not the metal. It's achieving the balance, and it's doing the right carpentry. That's where our outcomes come from. So just uh, Dr. Dubosay's, Professor Dubosay's presence here justifies that statement. Thank you very much, Isadore, because you, you did a very good work trying to, to, to measure the, the cone of economy. And I know your work about that. And it is very important work you did. And I, I, I gave the reference of your work every time I speak about the cone of economy. It is why on the question you are discussing, it is for me important to not fuse the SI joints. We, we still have much to learn about that. Um, I, I don't know what the right answer is and we are actively studying the SI joint right now in terms of biomechanics as well as clinical outcome. And with respect to the, the cone of economy, 
I, I have to acknowledge the work of, of our uh, basic scientists, uh, research engineers, Ram Hadass, Damon Marr, and their whole team. Uh, they're the ones that did all the legwork there. And I know that they're on this call as well. So they get the credit for, for doing that work and highlighting uh, the work that you started many, many years ago. Thanks. John, you mentioned that you don't think the SI joint should be fused, but we see a tremendous trend here in the U.S. where uh, the uh, oh, a lot of the deformity surgeons have no problem going across the SI joint and fusing it. What do you think? Are we right, wrong, or we don't know? I think it is, not, it is necessary to not cross the SI joint, to, to leave the SI joint free. And it is why we use uh, uh, always the uh, iliosacral screw, that is uh, uh, the entering, uh, cross, don't cross the ASI joint, it is behind the ASI joint, the iliosacral screw. All right, well. Blake, I thought you did a terrific job with your group. So thanks for organizing that. Um, yes, sir. Thank you. Great to see the outstanding neurosurgical input uh, uh, further on the rise of TBI. Um, so uh, really uh, cool topics. So I'm going to just uh, stir the pot a little bit from my end. Um, for me, the challenge of MIS right now still lies in the fact that despite substantial advance, and we just had a fantastic uh, far lateral course with Neil there and Rod and Juan Uribe and Luis Pimenta, the, the problem still lies in uh, the true long-term outcomes with long-term, I mean, minimum of two-year follow-up. I think um, uh, for the most part, MIS probably disrupts the spinal column less. I think the first paper today uh, showed that there's probably less deformity correction, at least with traditional MIS. And the, the problem really is... Um, the complications seem to happen at two years out, and that's the bane of uh, adult deformity surgery for starters. So uh, my, my plea is to basically look at uh, the two-year follow-up plus studies that will emerge soon and that Neil is heavily contributing to. And uh, the 90-day the window we can now probably start closing as uh, uh, probably being pretty well resolved that there are no major uh, huge differences outside of some blood loss issues and some infection risks. So I, I'd be curious to hear your uh, comments in that regard. Were you looking for Dr. Anand? No, Blake, you. Oh, sorry, me, me. Oh, yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, Dr. Um, uh, Shaffrey wrote an editorial a few years ago about how, you know, we kind of uh, were, were shortchanging ourselves on the data with MIS surgery and allowing, you know, 90-day, one-year, you know, follow-up as kind of an equivalent to the long-term deformity follow-up that we have. So I, I totally agree with your point that we need to be looking at these cases, you know, two, three, four, five years out, uh, to really get a better understanding of what's going on. But uh, it really does seem like, you know, th there's there's at least some equivalency there between open and, and MIS surgery. So I, I think we're on the right path. Uh, but I, I think patient selection is the most important key for all this. And, and going back to that algorithm I presented at the beginning, I, I think we really need to, to follow that and, and things like that to make sure we're doing this on the right patients. Any other comments from anybody else? Scott or Jack, do you want to take us out? Uh, thank you for uh, joining us, uh, Dr. Dubasse. Thank you for being active again. Dr. Chapman, you're out of your torpor. And uh, we wish everyone continued global health. And uh, we'll see everyone in the coming weeks. Thank you, Seattle Science Foundation, our, our great partners. All right. And thank you, Blake. You did a great job, and the fellows as well. And thank you, Dr. Dupin. Thank you. Great weekend. Thank you. thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Jens.